Um, all right, is everybody's trickle in? I think we can get started. Um, hey guys, uh, welcome to today's webinar, Building the Ultimate Marketing Tech Stack for 2025. Uh, my name is David Larango. I'm from Marketer Hire, and I'm happy to be joined by Dan McGaw, and I'll, who I'll introduce here in just a second. Uh, just a few housekeeping items to get things um, going here. Uh, today's session is being recorded, and the recording will be shared with you soon via email after the session is completed. Please use the Q&A section to submit questions for our panelists to answer at the end, whatever's at the top of your mind. Um, Dan is an expert. He will be happy to answer those. And then if you have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to us at Market or Hire, and we will be happy to help. So just a brief background on myself. Uh, I'm David Larango, 15 plus years e-commerce DTC retail experience. I have founded um, two consultancies, Startup Accelerators, and I own Excelio, um, focused on digital, digital growth and helping clients in CPG fashion, beauty, wellness, uh, vitamins and supplements, to kind of name a few of those. I'm also currently with Marketer Hire as a marketer in residence, helping businesses understand their needs and connecting them to the top 1% a freelance talent to hit their goals without having to hire full time. And let's move on to the introductions. Today's guest is Dan McGaw. He's the founder and CEO of McGaw, an analytics and marketing technology consultancy. He also owns and operates UTM.io, a freemium tool to help marketers build, share, and sync UTM links with their team. On top of that, he is also an award-winning keynote speaker and author of Build Cool Shit, a blueprint for creating a marketing technology stack. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dan. Um, could you say hi to the audience and just tell them a little bit about Magal? Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to kicking off. By the way, I love your headshot in the last last <laughs> slide that you have. You looked awesome, dude. So, but great to be here. Yeah, just like uh, David said, so I run one of the leading tech stack agencies out there. Uh, we help people build their stacks, basically solve a lot of problems. And I'll come back to that in my presentation to tell you a little bit more about what we do, how we do it, things like that. But really excited to be able to kind of jump in and help people not make some of the pitfalls that we see constantly when people choose tools, buy tools and get them implemented. So looking forward to helping people get really set up for 2025. So let's talk really quickly, high level agenda. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the complexities and the hype going on that we see in the marketplace. I'll then do a little bit more of an introduction on myself. We'll talk about some of the common pitfalls that we see people make decisions on. And then I'll show you some actual case studies and examples of success that we've helped create on our clients and seeing in their stacks to help you put some of this stuff actually into play. And then we'll talk about how you can take some action today. Uh, one thing that would be great, so is if you have any questions that are like at top of mind for you, just go over to that question and answer tool that is in the bottom of Zoom. Ask your question in there because what I'd like to do is get any kind of those questions ahead of time. And then I can double tap when I'm on those slides in my presentation. This is going to be a fast presentation. So don't get stuck into trying to read the screen. I put a lot of text on my slides. So that way when this thing is over and we send you the slides, you can read it after the fact. And it's not just all uh, you lose everything because you have to watch the recording. So we're going to jump in. One bit of advice I would say is I do have a small workshop in the middle of this. So if you have a browser open, just kind of have a browser open off to the side. I'm going to give you a URL and you can actually load your stack. I'm going to quickly train you on how you can build your stack using our diagramming tool, just so that way you understand where you're at today and then understand where you need to go tomorrow. So, but either way, let's kind of jump right in. Want to talk about how you can build the right growth stack for your team in 2025. So really simply put, all companies have a dream, right? Really, they want to be able to engage and convert their customers in extremely, extremely personalized experiences. They want to have that single view of the customer, be able to track all that data and activate it across advertising, across email and SMS, be able to put it on OTT and TVs and have this unified experience for customers. That's a huge thing everybody wants to accomplish. And at the same time, the expectation is, is that I have full visibility into the entire customer journey. I should know if they they saw my TV ad. I should know if they clicked my Facebook ad. I should know if they responded to the text. And most importantly, people want to understand how are they using our websites? How are they using our products? How do they go from web to mobile and see that whole experience? 
But for everybody who's trying to accomplish that, you know, things just get messy. At the end of the day, there's just too many damn tools and it makes it really hard. You get analysis paralysis. You don't know where to go. You're being sold all this hype sauce by all of these vendors are telling you, of course, we can do that. But we all know after the, the CDP uh, or explosion, many people bought them and then never took advantage of it because it's it's hard. It's not as easy as they say. And even if you do get the right tools, just knowing how to set those tools up to track your customer across, whether it be Google Analytics, and then they're in Salesforce, then they're in Adobe, maybe they're over in Shopify, maybe they're getting Twilio messages, SMS, and things like that. Trying to track that is really, really hard, and it becomes a nightmare for most companies. And it makes it even harder because as we think about 2025, there's even more complexity coming at us, especially with all the hype in the market, right? These marketing companies, these SaaS vendors, they are really, really good at marketing and they're even better at sales. They know how to use psychological tricks. They know how to use the commander of the message strategy to be able to take control of you and make it so that you actually buy something. And in many cases, you're not capable of using what they're selling you. And it makes it even harder because we have that MarTech maze. There's 14,000 different tools for you to understand what you're going to use and then how you're going to use it. And then with all the trends that are going on, should I do the composable stack? Should I not do the composable stack? Should I do the traditional thing? Should I put everything in Salesforce? All of that just makes it even harder. On top of that, if we think about the marketing trends, should I have a PLG strategy? Should I be a founder-led growth company? Hold on, I was told we should do community-led. We gotta go buy Mighty Networks. We gotta do community-led. Oh, but wait, Adam's on LinkedIn talking about how I need to do this new product-led thing. So we're all just getting pushed in a million different directions. And how are you supposed to know who you're supposed to trust? We're all trying to sell you something, right? At the end of the day. And then when you have cool things coming on the market where you see all these examples of how you can use cool tools like Clay or RB2B and all of these different things, in the B2B market, we're getting beat over the head constantly with all these cool tools, but can you actually use them? And then, like I said, this whole composable this, composable that, like, holy crap, like, what do I do? I mean, all this is is different marketing hype than what we used to say. Should you go best of breed and buy all in suite? Or should you, like, what should you do? Now it's, do I do the composable? Do I do the non-composable? It's all the same shit. It's just different hype that's getting you excited. So take a deep breath and realize most of it's bullshit. And at the end of the day, I obviously hear everybody wants to use AI, but you know, in most cases, you can't use the AI because you have shit dirty data. So even when you have a product like ChatGPT, you set it loose in your data and you have it look at everything, if your data is all messed up, it's going to give you really, really bad predictions on what you should be doing. And making sure that you have clean data and tools like Snowflake is even harder. If you have a CDP, it's kind of crazy but you have to figure out how to you get that clean data set up so you can do effective marketing using AI. And it all depends on clean data. And the complexity that is coming out now is the way that we have to think about our stacks, which this blew my mind. I was talking to John Miller. I had him on my podcast and he was talking about how you have a uh, vertical stack and you have to think about your business in that vertical stack. But then you have the horizontal layers of those stacks. So as an example, your website is at the top most layer of that vertical stack. And it's passing its data downstream through all kinds of different tools, like a CDP, which is going to be just behind your website because it's a data orchestration tool. And then when you think about like tools like Marketo and Salesforce and those ESP products like Braze, those are in the middle of your stack and they're communicating back and forth horizontally. And they're not really using the data from down beneath, which is in Snowflake or in BigQuery or other tools. They're definitely not using the data usually that's in like your Amplitude or your Mixpanel accounts. And that's where we have to understand how do you, one, horizontally integrate things so a department like sales and marketing can work together, but how do you also make it so you can vertically integrate all of that stuff so that way you can get your product data for your PLG strategy into Salesforce, or you can get your customer success data, which is happening in Zendesk, into your product so that way you can have better personalization on the product. So it is so complicated. Even I struggle to hold all of the balls in the air, so it can definitely get hard. And when you think about the next complexity is we all want to do one-to-one -one personalization, but is it really just a false dream and we're, we're putting our goals too high? It's kind of like being the kid that's not athletic and being like, I will be in the NBA. I will dunk on LeBron. Sometimes you got to realize you're just not going to get there and that's okay. 
And most of us are simply doing basic segmented experiences. And that is enough. That is good. I hate to say it, but I work with hundreds of companies advising them on their tech stacks. And doing just basic segmentation and just knowing that somebody is a girl compared to a guy, that is massive for most companies. So don't try to be like the gap and don't try to be like some of these crazy brands that are massively huge, like Fender Guitars, who is capable of actually doing that real-time personalization. I know it's where we all want to be, but it is very expensive, it is very hard, and it takes a lot of work. And a lot of times you got to come get a consultant like me to be able to make sure you're doing it right. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm a capitalist. I want you to pay me money. But at the end of the day, like I also don't want you to be dependent upon me. I want you to be able to do all the cool things you have. And then the biggest complexity that everybody is thinking about right now, at least in my world, is now that everything is warehouse first, like who the fuck knows how you're supposed to do that? What am I supposed to do this? And I see the smartest tech companies out there where I'm like, I am stupid compared next to that guy. They are struggling to even figure out this whole reverse ETL. How do I have warehouse first marketing? How do they actually do that? Because it requires cross department changes and it's really, really hard. So, but let's take a step back, right? I wanted to make sure I told you a little bit, like, why am I even the person that you should listen to on these things? Why am I somebody you can trust, right? So one, I've been doing this for over 25 years. I got my start in 98 sending mass emails before there was even mass email tools. I would, I've been building these tools for way, way too long. Before starting this company, I was the CMO over at Kissmetrics, one of the pioneers in marketing analytics. I was very fortunate to have the pleasure to work directly with Neil Patel, one of the world's most famous digital marketers, and his partner, Heaton Shaw. They recruited me, brought me in. I helped scale the company. We had a ton of fun. And then I left and I accidentally started this consulting company. But I was coined as one of the original growth hackers. Sean Ellis, the guy who actually came up with the term, was one of my personal mentors. And he's a dear friend that I love chatting with and super smart. I wish I could see that guy more often because he is just so wicked smart. And I even in, when I worked in house at other companies, I helped one of my companies scale in 18 months and got them acquired for 36 million. So I've just been around and done a lot of different things. But the biggest, most important fact about me is I'm a super lucky husband, have the best wife in the world. I'm a proud father of three young boys, 19, 13, and 10. We actually just moved to Barcelona, Spain. I'm in my offices in Orlando, but in two weeks from now, I'll be full-time in Barcelona. So if anybody's ever over in Europe or Spain, UK, any of those countries, hit me up because I'll be there for at least the next year. I also wrote the book called Build Cool Shit. So if you want to get a free copy of it, just go to buildcoolshit.com. We'll ship one directly to your house totally for free. Uh, so definitely happy to have you check that out. I host one of the leading podcasts talking about the stack where I get to talk to CMOs, CROs, heads of growth, all about how are they growing their company? What is their strategy and what tools are they using to unblock their growth? And at McGaw, my agency, what we do is basically help turn that stack mess into a modern data stack. And I do a lot of work with CDP. They're my number one partner. I've been a partner of theirs for 10 years. And we've had the opportunity to basically support everybody under the sun. We have helped Aura Ring rebuild their stack so they can do some really cool stuff. I help Bauer Hockey be able to build their CDP strategy so they can track customers online and off, which was one of the funnest projects that I got to work on. Playboy is currently a customer. We're helping them refactor and transform their business. And we've worked with all kinds of cool companies. But the one thing, obviously, everybody wants to see amazing logos. We like working with small businesses. So if you're a company doing $5 million or $10 million a year, honestly, like working with small companies and growing them really, really fast, then helping some of these bigger companies, hey, Liz, we're going to add 2% revenue this year. So uh, definitely, if you're a small business, don't get scared. And I focus with all of my time solving those two primary problems, right? Full visibility into the customer journey, making sure we can track every single touch point, making sure we can report on those touch points. Now that we have all of that data, I then help you ultimately activate that data so you can engage and convert them, whether that be through SMS, email, advertising campaigns, on-site pop-ups. But we try to make sure that it's all magical personalization where customers are like, damn, that's a, how'd they know that? And it's usually because we can get data and writ from somebody else. But let's switch gears again. I said that we were going to do a little bit of a workshop in this presentation. So what I want you to do is open up your browser. I want you to type in stackbuilder.com slash marketer hire. Okay. No capital letters. It will not work if you put capital letters in it, but I want you to go to stackbuilder.com and slash marketer hire. What you're going to do is it's going to load up a landing page, put in your corporate email, so your name, and then as well as the domain, whatever domain you have for the site that you want to know what's in your stack. 
to diagram what's going on. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you a quick training session on how you can use this product entirely for free with your team. So that way, you know what's in your stack. You know how the data flows are working. You can track your budget. You can track your expenses. You can track your renewal dates. You can even invite team members to basically actually track those tools with you and invite them to the platform. So hopefully you pulled that up. Do not try to keep up with me, okay? I want to make sure that you know how to use this for later. You're not going to be able to keep up with me because we all know I'm going way too fast. I work like a million miles a minute. So, but let's talk a little bit about uh, what this is going to look like. So what I did really quickly was, is I actually took marketer hire. So Steven, who's uh, helped set this up. I think I said Steven, Scott, but either way, help get that set up. First thing it does is it goes and scrapes your site and it loads up all of the tools that are on your website. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is try to pull the things down a little bit to give yourself a little bit of space. And the first advice that I give people is first, find your advertising pixels and then move them all to the left-hand side of the canvas. We're going to try to get all the advertising off to the left-hand side. And there's going to be some duplicates. You don't need to have the tracking pixel for Google conversion, Google ads, and Google remarketing. We know those are all the same kind of thing. So just delete any of those duplicates. You might find two Twitters. Just delete whatever one doesn't actually matter. But we're going to get all of the advertising stuff off to the left-hand side. We're then going to take any of those tools, which we would consider to be data storage tool, a CRM, an analytics product, a warehouse, anything like that. And we're going to put them all the way to the bottom because that's usually going to be where the data goes. It goes downstream to the bottom into those products. Now, we also have products that are going to be like Google Tag Manager or your CDP. We're going to put those in the center because it's usually going to be where we're sending data to. And then they're going to send the data out into different directions. And then you'll also notice we have interesting products on this landscape, which are going to be like Microsoft Clarity, a heat mapping and video tool for your website. We also have things like Hotjar and Visual Website Optimizers. These tools are actually interacting with your websites in usually cases. So I typically will put those up to the top, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, because they're usually sending data to the website because they're telling the website to do something. And then they're getting their data from the website. And what you'll notice in Marketer Hire, I took the domain, I have dragged the line. So if you click on the green border on that thing, it will actually enable you to get an arrow and you can take that arrow and then click on another green border and connect them. And we'll see, I took the main domain, Marketer Hire. I sent data to Google Tag Manager because that's usually where we send data. I then sent Tag Manager data onto Segment, which is the CDP that Marketer Hire has. I then started taking Segment, which is the, of course, data orchestration and customer data platform. So it's moving all of our customer data around. I now I'm starting to connect that to everything. So that way it sends the data to Active Campaign and Post Hog, which is a cool new analytics product if you're not familiar with it. It's also sending data down to HubSpot. You'll notice on the top right, I have the HubSpot form. HubSpot forms are, of course, sending data to HubSpot. And if I need to move a bunch of bulk things around, I can kind of grab the landscape and ultimately do that. If I'm missing a product like this stack, they, have, they most likely have Snowflake or BigQuery. I could just go to the Add Tool button, and now I added that tool directly to the canvas. I also think that they're probably using Data Studio. If you're not using Data Studio out there, please go use Looker Data Studio. It's a great product. But I can add those tools, just like if I needed to find anything for Tableau, which is a nice BI tool. I can very quickly look that up in the search, and then I can actually start adding those again to the landscape as well. And what you'll notice is I'll start moving those things around, so that way I can now start connecting them to other data stuff. Now. I want you to go use this tool, try to do this later, work on it a little bit with your team because understanding how your data flows around, understanding how these tools are integrated are literally the difference between single digit growth and double and triple digit growth. I've helped companies grow 3X and we're not talking taking a company from 5 million a year to 15 million a year. We're talking taking like a $100 million a year company to $300 million a year a company in three years because we got the data processing, we got the operations, we got the staff process, we got all of that set up. So either way, go check it out later. Uh, I'll have some additional offers around that in a little bit to help you get set up for yourself. And I totally respect if you wanna do all of this yourself and work with your team, I ultimately respect that. So, but let's talk about now, now that you understand what world you live in, right? You know what's going on. Let's talk about some of the big pitfalls that we see that people are making as we head into 2025, or even these are the same pitfalls I saw people going into the COVID craze when everybody was buying everything. The first thing that you really, really have to look out for is understanding that there is vendor lock-in. And this happens a lot. Like people get signed into contracts and get stuck. Salesforce is so well known for that. Hey, listen, if you just sign a two-year contract to Salesforce right now, we'll give you Pardot for free for three years. Okay, great. Well, that's awesome. But now I'm stuck with you for three years. And I'm also going to use the free product Pardot because you gave it to me for free so I can 
fire Marketo, but now I just set up my entire business on Salesforce and Pardot. So three years later, they're like, hey, listen, we increased your pricing by 45%. Uh, would you like to sign another one-year contract or do a two-year contract for 35% increase? Which one? And then you're like, well, you know, Pardot sucks. I'd really like to move to like HubSpot. And they're like, yeah, that's a sounds like sounds like a great idea. You should check that out. Then you do the analysis what the the change cost is going to be, and you're like, well, it's going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars in just implementation and labor to make the show. Ah, you know, I'll just stick with Salesforce. Fuck it. And that's why most people still use Salesforce is because they get locked into these crazy contracts. So really early on, you need to understand that costs are going to go up over time. They are going to reduce your bargaining power because they will negotiate you into a very good contract up front because two-year, three-year deals will get you a lot of savings. But at the end of the time, that does make you dependent upon some of these vendors, especially if you get locked into a suite like a Salesforce or a HubSpot. And HubSpot is great at locking you in. Like they, once you're in, like you're in. So it is really important to understand that. And a great solution for this is creating flexibility by using the composable model. And this is one reason why businesses like composable, composable stacks. You know, I've got Salesforce over here, but I use HubSpot for my marketing automation tool. And I'm using this separate analytics product to make it so that I keep things composable. And I've got segment over there for my CDP. But you know what? If I want to leave HubSpot, because I did my integration through CD or segment, I can leave HubSpot really, really easily and I can change things out. So it is really going to be important to get that stuff going. Going, you got to identify those potential lock-in scenarios and negotiate that in your terms. And this next tip I'm going to give you is going to save you thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on wasted time. The number one mistake people do is they're like, I have an idea. We should roll out MedPick. I want to use the new MedPick program. I'm going to go buy Salesforce and I'm going to build this elaborate process and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in licenses and labor and changing the processes. And I'm going to build this all into Salesforce. Yeah, but then when you find out that that process sucks, you got to unwind it all. So don't do that. One, assess your current processes and then build that out ultimately and understand where your bottlenecks are. Then define those workflows in spreadsheets. Go use a spreadsheet and understand and use that spreadsheet and build the process in the spreadsheet, which is free. Google Sheets are free. Excel is free, right? Well, I think Excel, you could charge some money now. Build those processes in the spreadsheets and then use that process for three months or six months and change the process so that way you can be agile and you can be nimble. Then once you have actually understood that process and you're like, all right, this is working, ultimately that is when you so start going and looking at tools because you actually know what you need. But the most important thing is don't buy the tool. This is the mistake everybody makes. They get a tool and they're like, I'm so excited. Let's buy it. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Research and figure out what tools are going to work. Consider all the factors that you have and then choose which tool that you're most likely going to move forward with, but don't buy it. Do a proof of concept. Make sure that ultimately the tool is going to work for your needs and do multiple proof of concepts. Yes, it's going to slow things down, but you'll make a better decision, which is going to grow your business faster. Slow down to speed up. It always works better. Now, let's say you choose a tool. You're like, all right, I'm going to buy Marketo or I'm going to buy Amplitude. And let's just pick on Amplitude. They're one of my partners and I ultimately know their sales team hates it when I say, say this to my prospects. What you're going to want to do is do not buy the enterprise contract. Do not buy the mid-market contract. Do not even buy the small business contract. Try to use a self-service product that they have and start your implementation on their free version or on their self-service product. So Amplitude, you can get implemented for $49 a month. You don't have to pay some crazy big plan. And even companies like Marketo, you can actually work in a three-month implementation free account because you're not going to pay for it until you're going to get value out of it. And everybody buys these tools and then implements. And six months later, they've gotten no value from the tool because they don't even know how to implement you got to implement before you get into these contracts. So implement that tool in a phased approach where you're using the free account or you're using the lowest tier without signing an annual agreement. Make sure that you've trained your team and your team is actually enabled on these tools. It's the number one reason why tools fail is that the teams don't actually use it. But the biggest thing is don't buy the tool until you're actually going to use it. You have to make sure that you can actually get it stood up then pay for it because then at the moment that you spend money, you're actually getting value. Compared to most companies, they buy a tool, doesn't even do anything for two years. Can't tell you the number of companies I see that happen with. 
And then after you buy the tool, just make sure you have clear metrics on how you're going to optimize it, how you're going to get going, and how you're going to collect feedback. So naturally, another big thing that you're going to have in 2025, if you're buying tools, you got to get team buy-in, make sure that the team is bought in, you understand where the training gaps are, you have clear goals aligning that, and you have cross-team collaboration. Really, really important. Also, this whole traditional CDP versus the composable CDP. Listen, that stuff was absolutely hoopla to get you to buy different tools. It was a great marketing program, but understand like there are reasons to go in either direction and don't fall into the marketing hype. I also talked a little bit about having AI get blocked by dirty data earlier. So definitely want to make sure you don't do that. If the impact of unclean data is absolutely crazy, like you really don't want to have uh, bad data. So you're going to want to make sure that you have good data management solutions to ultimately do that, enabling that you have good, effective data cleansing across your different systems. So segments got to be integrated well with Marketo. Marketo has got to be integrated in well with Salesforce. Salesforce has got to be connected well with Zendesk. Zendesk has got to be connected over with your analytics product. You all got to get this going to the data warehouse, but it actually has to have clean data. And that's where having a really good data taxonomy and somebody who understands how to structure this data and making sure that you have good tagging is at the end of the day where you're going to win. I will tell you this, again, the difference between single digit growth and double and triple digit growth is literally having a good taxonomy, having good clean data, having good processes across the tools. It's not because you bought Marketo. Nobody became a $300 million company because they bought just Marketo. They had a successful implementation of Marketo and that enabled them to actually do stuff. There's a great video from the CRO of Shopify. And he said, it is not the talent that makes the difference in the company. It is the processes and systems and tools that we build and enable them to become great talent while working in the process. Now, don't get me wrong. You can't go hire a bunch of morons and expect them to do a good job. But if you give a bunch of really talented people, shitty process and shitty tools, they're not going to go anywhere. So you got to make sure you get some of the stuff right. Now, I've been talking really fast. I gave you some of the things you got to look out for. Now, if you have any questions, definitely throw that in the Q&A. But let's talk about some actual examples. These are real companies. I use two of mine because my company, my clients don't always like showing off all of their data, but I wanted to make sure that you can actually see how some of this works, whether it be, hey, let's figure out lead scoring and how that works with a CDP and a CRM and our marketing automation tool and things like that. So first, let me introduce you to RealThread. RealThread is a high-end t-shirt printing company, and they do large orders for companies like Amazon and like 40,000 uh, t-shirts, all the way down to a small mom and pop that's doing 36 t-shirts. So they have a self-service business where they never talk to the customer until they've already purchased. And then they have an enterprise business, which ultimately is doing big orders where they're doing like enterprise sales. So a very, very unique stack. They came to us when they had a lot of problems. Their number one goal, though, which is what you need to make sure you have before you go build the stack, is you need to understand your main goal. Their goal was to increase the customer conversion rate from people coming to the website. I have somebody who comes to the website. They have a lot of traffic. How do I get those people to actually become customers? And what we identified was is they have too many leads, and they were not able to understand which ones of those leads were valuable. So we had to build a lead scoring model so that way they knew when Amazon was coming in compared to Timmy's Bake Shop, which they don't need to talk to from a sales perspective, that person is self-service. So the original stack that they had, they had Segment, great foundation, they had Intercom, they had Kissmetrics, but they had Salesforce living on an island and it was not integrated well with anything. And then they had SalesLoft, which was like their outbound prospecting tool, which wasn't even connected to Salesforce, which I was like blown away by. So what we did was, was redesigned a new stack. First thing is we made sure that Segment was running the entire data pipeline, sending all of its data to Salesforce. We also hooked them up with Amplitude, which is a much better analytics product than Kissmetrics. I think Kissmetrics is out of business now, sadly enough. However, you'll notice that we added Clearbit, a data enrichment tool. We added a marketing automation tool, Autopilot. We kept Intercom, but we put it on an island because it was just used for chat. We made sure SalesLoft was integrated in with Salesforce. We added call rail for call tracking, but you'll notice what we did was, is we did what we call data recycling. So constantly we're getting data back into segment from clear bit to enrich it goes all the way down the pipeline. Things are happening in autopilot because things are happening in Salesforce. Again, that data is being sent down to segment and getting all that data over to amplitude. Let's get back on track though. We noticed that for them to increase more customers, they need to close more enterprise customers. And for them to be able to do that, they needed to turn all of these thousands of leads into marketing qualified leads. So we work with them. We came up with a lead scoring model. You'll notice at the top there, it says behavior. Behavior is the best way to understand that somebody is actually going to become a customer. 
understanding the actions they are taking. So we use the behaviors, ultimately getting tracked through segment to do that. And then of course we had identity attributes, like are they a VP, what size company and things like that. So what this screen is showing you is their tools library where they were getting thousands of leads a month. Basically the person is going in and entering just their email. So because we are only asking for email, we get a lot of emails. Problem is, I don't know who the pe person actually is that's filling that out. But we took that data from segment we sent it over to Clearbit, which is a data enrichment tool. And then Clearbit sent back this whole payload of every single thing about a meet from Clearbit. I use Clearbit in there because they have a lot of stuff. So what we can see is I got a whole payload of all of this data, all of this information, which I did not have before. I then was able to take this data, send it to Autopilot, which was our marketing automation tool. I got his picture. I got his LinkedIn. I got his Twitter. I know how much revenue they have. I know how many employees they have. I know how many patents they have. I got all of this demographic firmographic and technographic data, as well as all of their, their activity of what they were doing. Now, Autopilot directly integrated in with Salesforce. So immediately, all of this data is also in Salesforce as well. So now when a sales rep goes and picks up this lead, all of the research has been done for them and they go, hey, Amit looks like a really cool dude. I see that he went to college in Santa Barbara. I should definitely bring that up in my first email to him so that way he will respond. Now it all flows into Salesforce and all the different tools. Now, that data from Salesforce is synced in with Autopilot. So Autopilot's moving that data around. So I build an operational journey in Autopilot. So if it sees that you're a VP, it's gonna increase your lead score by a certain amount. If it sees that your lead score is going up and up and up, obviously we get a higher lead score. People reach it, we actually know to contact them. But we can use any of the attributes on their contact record. So because I enriched over 100 record or 100 values, I have all of that data. So I'm able to score based upon a ton of different things. And then what you'll also notice, which this video is slower than my mouth, um, you'll also notice all the activities that we were tracking in segment, which you saw on the left hand of that screen earlier, when they download a resource, when they have an action, an event that we want to track, that also is going and creating an additional increase to the actual lead score. So we're using those uh, multiple different dimensions to increase lead score. And what this does is it builds a constant lead score that's constantly going up and down. We even have decrement to our lead score and then putting it immediately on the record. And what happens is, is when there is a higher than 150 lead score, there's a Slack message and a Salesforce task that automatically goes to whoever owns that contact. And because we did this, we drove massive growth in their business. And this is just one of the multiple things that we did with them. So that with that goal to increase customer conversion rate, we hit it out of the park increase their customer conversion rate by over 50% in a year to basically ultimately scale their business. And Drew's a great guy, the founder, one of the smartest people I got to work with. He is a tech stack nerd, tech stack nerd too. But let's move on because I wanted to talk about some AI. A lot of people come to me and they're like, I'm not really sure how to use AI. Right now it's helped me write some blog posts and it's helped me like, you know, even my presentation that I created, half of this was created with AI. People are using it for creative situations, but people are asking me all the time, like, how do I use it to grow my business? So at Maga, like I said, we're that tech stack agency. One of my great gifts in life is I'm great at doing webinars and speaking on stage and stuff like that and creating great content. So we get a lot of leads that come into our system. And what I want to do is I want to reach out to people personally. I don't want to just be like, here's my nurture sequence. You're just like everybody else. I want to try to give them some personalized touches and I want to make sure that we are doing something authentic. But when you're getting thousands of leads, you don't really have the ability to sit down and write emails all day. I don't want to do that. I don't have the time for that. I've got to do other things. So I figured, why don't we just automate that with ChatGPT? So what I did was I found out that ChatGPT has an integration in with Zapier. If you're not familiar with Zapier, it is not Zapier because Zapier makes you happier. It's called Zapier. Go ask the founders. Either way, went to Zapier and I was like, okay, so I use Autopilot as my marketing automation tool. Whenever a new contact comes into the system, I'm going to add them to this new list when they hit a certain lead score. So remember that 150 lead score? I do the same thing in my business. So they hit that 150 lead score, they get added to a list. Then what I did was, is I started a conversation in ChatGPT using Zapier. And I wrote this wonderful prompt, basically said, hey, make sure you read my instructions twice. A good prompt trick is make sure you tell uh, ChatGPT, make your outcomes perfect. And it will do a really good job. But either way, I wrote a task. This task is for you to write a very short, and I mean very short, highly personalized, cold outbound email to this person, first name and last name at this company. Here's the website. This will be a response to them coming in. You will write the first line of this sentence, go do research, blah, 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 blah. I gave it a bunch of information and then it had to go do that. 
So I did a bunch of testing, did a bunch of iteration on my prompts and then got it to work out. So after ChatGPT does that stuff, I then have it create a draft in my Gmail. So my Gmail inbox, I merge var everything and everything into that. And then I have it load that personalized message into the body of that email. So what happens is, this is rainforestcaribbean.com. Never met Donna Lee. I have no idea who she is. She just a lead that came into the system, hit the lead score. The first thing it does is ChatGPT wrote this email. I came across Rainforest Caribbean and I was impressed by your company's commitment to sustainability. I also noticed you were recognized for the innovative use of technology in the tourism industry. As someone who understands the challenges of running a stack, you know, ultimately I wanted to reach out about our services, maybe help companies like that. Does a quick call make sense to talk about your pain points? I did not write this, but that is a decent email. I would give this a 6.5 out of 10 in regards to like emails that I'm going to send cold. Now my inbox get loaded with these drafts. My assistant will review them. I will then come back to them later and I will choose if I want to add anything to them. Do I know them? Do I not know them? And then I'll send them out. So really, really simple way to hack your business and use ChatGPT. But if you remember, if you have bad data, none of this is going to work. That's why you got to have good, clean data. That's why the good data is so important. That's why they say data is the new gold. But you know what? Most companies have a ton of data. They're not using it because it's garbage. So either way, I digress. Let's move to another example. So the first example I showed you was how do you do kind of a B2B lead scoring? Just so you know, I actually use the same thing on my direct to consumer customers, D2C, and my B2C customers. Somebody hits this lead score, okay, add them in this retargeting pool that I'm just gonna spend a whole lot more, more money on. Okay, great, they hit this lead score. Okay, I want you to add them to these six different channels because I don't wanna spend money on people who aren't actually gonna work. And LinkedIn advertising is really expensive. So one, I only put certain people in there. And yes, I have DC customers who I have LinkedIn advertising with, but I also want to make sure that those low value customers, they might not ever even get advertising. So we still use lead scoring in all of the businesses that I would try to work with. Now we talked a little bit about some cold outbound or some ward emails, this same exact strategy I have used with my D2C clients. So that way they're sending a personalized welcome email to somebody joining their service. We can go do research on people because we have access to products like Experian or Melissa data. There's all kinds of vendors out there that sell us information. So that way we can do some stuff. And just so you know, don't be creepy. If you go to magal.io, my website, look up, uh, don't be creepy with your personalization, how to be, how to do great personalization without being creepy. Great talk about like some of the mistakes I've seen people make, as well as how can you do it without being creepy? Because the last thing you want to do is be like, hey, Johnny, I know your daughter's six years old. Her name's Cynthia. I would be like, I'm never talking to this company again. Why do you know my six-year-old daughter's name? So don't be creepy. Either way, Let's move on. Let's give my last example, which is ultimately fuck doing support tickets. Like I get so many support tickets at utm.io, it wastes a lot of team team time. So we wanted to ultimately make our support system be augmented by ChatGPT. So if you haven't heard of utm.io, great product, freemium thing, go check it out. But it is the category king for UTM link management. Our clients range, for, range from Google to Cox Automotive to Shopify to other, all kinds of cool companies, like tons and tons of cool companies use the product just because we do one thing and we do it really, really well. But we get a lot of support tickets because we also have a freemium product with tens of thousands of free users that's just using us all day. They don't know what UTMs are. They don't know how to use it. So they send us very, very basic questions, which are great. We want to be helpful, but it also takes a lot of time for a human to respond to those. So what did I do? I go to Zapier and I'm going to automate something again with ChatGPT. So first... I go to Help Scout because that is, I choose Help Scout when there is a new conversation created that comes into the system. Zapier hears that. Zapier then sends a message to ChatGPT, says, hey, ChatGPT, let's start a new conversation. I want to I want to figure this out with you. I again wrote a great prompt. Hey, you're a helpful support associate who works at utm.io, who has done research to become an expert on providing good support for our self -serve, from our self-service help center. I told it to go learn from us as well. I also gave it additional in information. It's training. You're replying as the rep be helpful, give them great information. So we wrote a great prompt, did some experimentation on it, got it all set up. When that happens and ChatGPT has come back, we then ultimately reach back out to Help Scout because we automate all of this stuff. Help Scout then will add a draft reply. We'll send a reply ultimately to this person. We set it up so it just sets it as a draft. So that way it still gets reviewed. But ultimately that whole zap got built. So again, what happens, right? We automate this process. Well, let's just say you're a customer. You come in, whoops, I think I actually went a little too fast on that one. I actually missed the thing. There we go. 
So this is uh, as if a customer had reached out. Obviously, I use myself, but I struggle to know how to use the campaign field in the UTM builder. Can you give me some information on best practices? We probably get this question a few times a day in different ways from different companies. But I wrote that prompt to ultimately answer the question. So almost instantly, what happens is, is a zap goes out, zap comes back. And then there is a response that is created for the rep, the support rep to email them back. So, hey, the campaign field usually is there to identify a specific campaign or promotion. It's important to be consistent with your conventions and it makes it easier to track. And then it gives them four tips on what they should do to ultimately do that. We still have a support rep who reads this really quickly, then edits it and then hits send. So, you know what? If you don't integrate your tech stack and automate yourself out of a job, I'm going to help your competitors do it anyways. So make sure you start learning how to do this stuff. So let's wrap up because I said I'd finish in 40 minutes and I'm right on time. So let's talk a little bit of the wrap up. Some, some key problems. One, dirty data is going to limit anything you want to do with AI. So if you aren't ready to clean your data, be careful with all the AI hype because it can really be tough unless you're just using it in practical examples for your team to be more efficient. Number two is that disconnect disconnected systems are going to hinder your opportunities to be able to actually grow the business and know what's going on. Three, tool overload, really, really important. Don't overbuy, don't, don't commit to what you can't do. And then of course, inconsistent processes across your team, doesn't matter what you buy, you're not going to be successful. That's why I say use the spreadsheet, build the process, get a good process, then buy the tool. So the first step to optimizing today is for you to go to the Stack Builder. Again, stackbuilder.com slash marketer hire, and you can get started with understanding what's going on in your stack. But if you really want to take the next step, I have a unique offer today, which I don't offer often. So I am $1,000 an hour when my consultants hire or my clients hire me and have me on their projects. My team is not as expensive as I am, but as a CEO who has been doing this forever, I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to charge that. And I'm going to increase my rates later this year as well, or actually early 2025. I'm $1,000 an hour, but I'm willing to spend 30 minutes with you reviewing your tech stack and your tech stack diagram, understanding your business objectives and your business goals, and then giving you clear advice on what I would do and what I wouldn't do. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. So if you want somebody to come be your cheerleader, that's not me. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be like, listen, I think that's a pretty bad idea. You might want to consider these three options. Or I might just be like, dude, you're super smart. Like you're already way ahead of everybody. If you want to book that, just email me at dan at magal.io. My assistant will help you ultimately find that 30 minutes lot. I'm pretty busy right now with the move to Barcelona. So it might be in a couple of weeks, but Hey, listen, $500 consultation for free, not something I offer very much, but I like the guys at marketer hire. They've done a good job for me. We've used their consultants before. So definitely recommend you check them out. And if you're one of those people that's like, listen, I just want to unblock my growth today. I know I need help. Our typical packages start at $4,600 a month. They go up to $23,000 a month for our typical starter packages. And we have projects we're doing now that are $50,000 a month. And we have projects now that we're doing that are $1,900 a month. We're just here to ultimately help unblock your growth. At the bottom, you'll see contact Asa at maga.io. Not Asa. His name is Asa. He's one of the greatest guys. He was actually uh, the first sales rep that helped Scott Brinker scale I Interactive, Scott Brinker's company, you know, the guy that made the landscape. Ace is also a legend in the MarTech space. So he's also going to be a great guy for you to be able to talk to. So, but that being said, I've covered a lot and I have gone fast. So there will be a recording. I will send out the slides as well. So happy to get those things to you, but would love to see what questions we have. And if you want to follow up with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can shoot me an email and also just join a Slack community. I'm in a lot of different communities where people are able to find me. So David, thanks so much. I think I'm going to give you screen share because you have a couple slides you wanted to review as well. I do indeed. I'll take over from here. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, we covered a heck of a lot today. Um, as a marketer is doing this for quite a long time too, uh, I actually learned a lot as well, Dan. So super helpful. One of my favorite topics and I couldn't agree with you more about being efficient, smart with the tech stack. Just to take a minute to explain how marketer hire can help here. If you are attending this webinar and concerned about the time or expertise needed to manage a successful marketing tech stack, and Dan went through a lot, and there are a lot of pieces there, and he went through quick, um, and I would encourage you guys to look at all of those as a marketer. But this is where I can help connect you with more than 100 growth marketers and experts available on our platform to step into and give you the perfect blend of skills, experience, and flexibility to start building that tech stack, building the flows that you saw today. If you're interested, after the presentation, visit marketerhire.com to book a custom scoping session today. Uh, and with that, um, that concludes our presentation. If you guys have to leave, thank you guys so much for joining. But if you can stick around, we're going to have a lot of great questions coming in, and we'll do our best to answer those over the next five to 10 minutes with Dan. 
All right. So Dan, I'm going to read these and then kind of let you answer them if that works for you. Yeah. Sounds good to me, bud. Cool. All right. So with the increasing overlap between CRMs and CDPs in managing customer data and driving personalization, how do you see the roles of each evolving in the coming years? Should businesses prioritize one over the other, or is there a case for integrating both to optimize customer experience? Yeah, very and man, really, really good question. So I think the first the first question that we always have is what is your team capable of? And then what is the culture of your company? Some companies lean very developer centric and very data centric, and that's where CDPs can be very, very successful. However, there's other companies which are very sales led and very kind of like, hey, we use traditional Marketo and Salesforce stuff. And to be on the to make sure a typical RevOps or marketing operations person really struggles with a CDP because the entire data model is different. And that's where an engineer is more successful. However, an engineer or a data analyst, they usually can really struggle inside of a CRM because it does not work in the way that they want to work. So really the tools are very, very complementary. Usually we'll have a CRM and a CDP. Now, if you are a B2B company using a traditional CRM, like a Salesforce or a HubSpot, usually the CDP is gonna send data to Salesforce or HubSpot. And the CDP is also gonna collect that data from the CRM um, and then be able to send that to other places. So it is the best of using both things. So you should definitely wanna think about using those tools together. But if you're a D2C business or a B2C company, right? Some people call their MailChimp their CRM and things like that that. That is also a world where there are certain CDPs which can replace your MailChimp, but usually they're very, very expensive at that. So I definitely think there's a world with both. If you're on the B2C side, CDPs are great as well and sometimes can replace your CRM, but I think the tools are meant to be complementary. Again, going to those vertical versus horizontal layers of the stack, the CDP is typically above and below the CRM and the CRM is in the middle of the layer. Um, so they typically are things you're going to keep in the same boat. Awesome. Dan, I am one of those people that calls MailChimp and or Clavio CRM. So I'm guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally normal. It's, to it's totally normal. So. <laughs> All right. What impact will Gen AI, generative AI have on the current future marketing tech stack? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is some people are using Zapier and tools like I'm using to ultimately try to integrate in some of that customized personalization and things like that to make it so that we can have things personalized, we can have conversations. Um, so I see a lot of that. I think as we move forward into the future, we're seeing more that get baked into products like Segment Twilio has their AI products that are giving them prediction capabilities, creating audiences and things like that. I think the thing that we are most cognizant of when we think about this is that AI is here to empower us to do magical, cool things. But if we don't know how to leverage that AI, then it's entirely pointless. So as a key skill that I'm even make, teaching my kids, like I'm teaching my 10 year old how to use AI and how to get things done because writing good prompts are going to be really where the difference is. Uh, but stacks will become easier over the next five or 10 years. And I even understand in my business, some of my team is going to get replaced with AI. We're already testing having AI write the implementation for us. Uh, and then that way it's prepped and ready to go. In the future, AI will do all that stuff for us. Um, I have several questions. I want to ask you on that too, but I'm, <laughs> I'm with you on how utilizing uh, generative, generative AI as a helper, right? Within the tech stack in general. And then I myself was not, was a late adopter and now I use it for prompts as well. So yeah, no, I, I was cool. a late adopter too. And uh, I typically am a laggard, which most people find kind of funny. I typically am late to the party. And then I like, I'm like, all right, it's my party now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you take over. Yeah, you become life of the party. You're late, but then life yeah. Yeah. All right, I think, let's see what we have. We should have a couple more. How do you envision agentic platforms fitting into the MarTech stack? And what role do you think they'll play in shaping future marketing strategies? Yeah. So just a, a agentic platforms are ultimately when you have multiple a, uh, AI agents working together for you. Um, and I actually have this process. So when I do my podcast, I've built multiple GPTs that manage certain parts of the process. And what I will do is basically get those GPTs agents to work together to ultimately create the whole podcast uh, set up for me. So I think, you know, this is an area of like a lot of unknown, but I think what you're going to start seeing is like Zendesk has their agents that they're rolling into their platform and using that. It's going to be very interesting to see how do we connect these agents across platforms, because there are sales agents out there now that are doing sales activities for us um, in certain platforms. And how do we get those agents to work together? 
There's a great video from Eric Schmidt, the former uh, CEO of Google, and his talk was not supposed to be leaked, but it is the most amazing talk talking about how agents will work together to basically do everything for us in a company in the future. So Google, Eric Schmidt, um, AI agents, um, I think it was like a Harvard talk or Yale talk. Uh, but go check that out because that was that blew my mind. And that's when I was like, all right, AI is my party now. I got to step into this game too because it blew my mind. <laughs> all right. One last one, Dan. Um, and then yeah. we'll wrap up. What are the best marketing tools to use when you have no or a very small budget? Yeah, uh, no. So Google Analytics stack, Google Data Studio, BigQuery would be like my data stack. From a website perspective, I typically am still a really big fan of WordPress, but I think that's just because I'm old and I'm familiar with it. I know a lot of people are choosing to use Webflow uh, now for websites. I already talked about the analytics part. When I think about the CRM and like marketing automation, I think MailChimp is really affordable. It can get you really, really far. It does a lot of cool stuff in it. So I think that's great. CRM perspective, I definitely think um, Pipedrive is probably one of the ones that I recommend for startups. Capsule CRM is decent. Stride is good. Um, but like HubSpot and Salesforce can get really expensive. When I think about B2B marketing automation tools um, and their kind of like space, uh, Orto, O-R-T-T-O is a pretty cool product. They do a pretty decent job. Uh, CRM, marketing automation tools for small business. I said MailChimp, Clavio is another good option. Uh, support tools, I think Help Scout is probably one of the best priced in the marketplace. Of course, Slack, everybody's got to use that. Um, but that would be like the basic startup stack that I would kind of look at. Again, if you want to show me your startup, like more than happy, Dan at Magal.io, happy to get on a call and be like, I would do that. I would do this. I would look at that one, check out this one. But there's so many tools that come on the marketplace today that like even I can't keep up. Um, like, and I live on Product Hunt. Like every morning I check my Product Hunt, what new tool is coming out there? I'm on Reddit, I'm on Hacker News and I'm like looking for new tools. Um, like the, my new favorite tool right now is plusdocs.ai. It helped me create most of my talk. ChatGPT helped me figure out my script. I then took that to plus.ai. It built my slide framework. A lot of the slides I have from other decks I do. So I pulled in different things from different places, but plus.ai or plusdocs.ai like really helped me a lot. So like those things are like really cheap, low level AI tools for a startup that, Hey, I can build my pitch deck and, AI will help me with it because uh, that shit, that can be hard. You like get inside your head. Like, am I doing it right? But AI does. And you're like, oh, I can critique him. It's so easy. Yeah. Or her. I yeah. don't want to call AI a guy. I yeah. critique <laughs> it. Yes. Thanks, Dan. Um, we're getting to a close, guys. Um, starting to wrap up. Um, thank you all for staying and for the great questions. And a big thank you to Dan for joining us today. Um, really great stuff, Dan. I learned a lot. And I'm I'm sure everybody else did as well. So we'll be following up everyone with the recording, the slide deck, and some helpful resources later today. If you have any questions for Dan or myself, and I really encourage you to take him up on that free offer. I think that's fantastic. I might myself or a couple of the clients that I work with actually, Dan. Um, but please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or get in touch with our teams here at marketerhire.com and at maga.io. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me, Market or Hire. Great to meet everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.